you for being recognized uh, as the recipient of the 2022 uh, Lifetime Achievement Award in the Visual Arts uh, for his uh, all of his uh, very hard work that he's been doing for decades here in Houston and all over the world. Uh, and also here with us today is uh, Danielle uh, Burns Wilson, who is the curator and artistic director at the um, Project Row Houses. So, uh, settle in, and we're going to give them the floor, and it's just going to be a conversation between the two about uh, early work. Thank you. So I did, 
And to make a long story short, I found out that he was the assistant dean of the College of Washington Sciences. And after Todd was out of school the spring semester on academic probation. <laughs> and that was the connection of my coming to Houston of that particular way. So this is how I got to Houston by after Todd being home on academic probation <laughs> and the connection of Dr. Freeman. And I never knew that that would be very significant in my life. It because if it wasn't for Freeman, or Dr. Freeman, or Doc as we call him, I probably wouldn't be a part of it. This is how I was introduced to the fourth ward, the third ward, the fifth ward, Sunny Side. And prior to that, I had someone to come looking for me in the art department. It was Ray Douglas Karen. He was the editor of the yearbook. And he was in trouble. He needed photographs to finish the page because his tennis coach, who recruited him down in Corpus Christi, was the uh, uh, he was the company rep who was in charge of publishing the yearbook for TSU, and Ray was the editor. And so Ray came looking for me, and I ended up taking a bunch of pictures over to uh, the. Uh, yearbook office, and he says, something old, something new. Black men will work their way and go. And that was back in 1970, so we've been together ever since then. But to show you how it worked, when I took the job from Dr. Freeman, and I went there on a Tuesday night, we had to work on Tuesday and Thursday nights to film the various activities that was going on in the Model Cities program. And I looked up, that was Ray on one of the cameras. And so from that, Dr. Freeman talked to us and said, I need for you to go to the third ward and to the fifth ward and to Sunnyside and to document and bring you that program because I want the residents to be able to see what we can do and put up the display. And so Ray and I began to go out and to photograph, we come back at night and develop the film. And uh, Ray would sleep on one of the tables while I'm developing my film. Then when my film is drying, Ray would develop his film. Then we would go to French's and get some chicken and come back and out of the frame. Then uh, I would lay down and go to sleep in Ray would print. So about 5 o'clock in the morning, he would dry and pitch on that apron screen. And then we would take him back to Dr. Freeman's office at 8.30 at 9 o'clock in the morning. And just praying over the pictures. And uh, from that, we was able to go to Southwestern, uh, either Southside Cameron, and Ray get his list of supplies, I get my list of supplies. And so this is how we actually started. This is how we actually worked. And if it wasn't for Tom Freeman, or Dr. Freeman, most faculty people called him Tom. We called him Doc. Uh, you know, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today. And if it hadn't been for Tom, I never would have probably came to Texas, not all the way from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. So that connection, so this was something that was, I had no control over as to the people that I was going to meet, things that I was going to do, and this connection. So what is this that causes one to really to follow the, or, 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 or give a given path, or just this in calling? And so uh, my purpose, I came to Texas and I walked with me the things that I learned about central community, uh, respect to the elders. Uh, people ask, why do you put all, put emphasis on the downtrodden, the people that are struggling, the human perception of the human spirit, uh, you know, is so important. Uh, people in our community didn't go hungry. If someone didn't have uh, community people took care of them, sent some food over there, whatever. Guys in the evening that work, done the uh, uh, country work and the manual labor stuff, to stop in the evening and drink a couple of beers, we were playing in the street, and we would come down the street, they'd be kind of tipsy and so forth, say, hey, y'all hear the hunting all boys, get out this street. And hey, we better get out the street. You know, but they tell us what to do, so we go on home. Uh, neighbors in the neighborhood, if they see you doing something wrong, come in. 
they give you a spanking, take you home. When you get home, you get another one. But this is how I was raised, uh, you know, uh, basically, and you respect your elders and so forth and on. So these are the kind of values that I found out in Houston, and I found in my good friend Ray Carrington that we had some similarities of things of this nature. And then there was Herbert Cobos, who was the tennis coach, which he motivated us. You young men should take off and go to Europe. You should see the world. You should do these things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the things he done for tennis and that program. And as a photographer, we traveled across uh, close to Texas, both out to uh, Southern University, Jackson State, and so forth, provided. Uh, but, I mean, the you look pictures of uh, uh, the schools and all of those kinds of things, he encouraged us, he just dark rooms available to us to work and to learn. And this is how Ray actually got to work. Ray Carrington was a journalist major, history major. He had no interest in photography, but this kind of came about. But, so this was a calling, uh, you know, this way. And this is why I always mention Ray because of our conversation because our intellect of being roommates and being so close to each other and the similarities of things that we do. But also, I mean, like you talked about growing up and being a photographer and documenting mm -hmm. the community. And oftentimes you talk about your grandmother's photo book. Well, my grandmother was a storyteller. Uh, she could sit and mesmerize you with the stories she would tell. Now, mind you, TV was available, but the TV came on at 7 o'clock in the morning, and if you fell asleep in the evening at 10 o'clock at night, all you could see is that little dot. But the TV was basically all. The news would go off, and then the national anthem would play, and, and, and boom, it was gone. So during the summertime, we lived next door to my grandmother. Well, I had three brothers and two sisters, my mother and my father, and we lived next door to my grandmother. And we spent a lot of time over there. My grandmother worked as a day worker. She worked at William Carey University, which was at the time it was called William College, William Carey College, as a cook. Her and her, her sister, uh, Duke, we call her, her name is Mary. And uh, most evenings you could see him coming across this big old field carrying a shopping bag. And they'd be bringing extra ham and chicken and rolls and things home uh, from that. And, uh, you know, it would be just a beautiful sight. So I had a photograph I called the rainbow. Because, you know, at the end of the rainbow, there was always a gift or something. So when grandmother was coming that way, there was always that. Um, she never complained about anything. Uh, and she was a seamstress. Uh, she always uh, would sew, and she would quilt, and uh, she would had a beauty parlor in her house to a degree for friends of hers. She would press hair, and at the time she would smoke cigarettes from time to time. My grandmother would, but she was a God-fearing woman who went to church every Sunday. Sit on the second row so she can look into Reverend Bullock's mouth to hear exactly what he was saying, she would say. She was, uh, uh, she was the treasurer for her circle uh, at church. But also she was just did storyteller. And she worked for uh, Dr. Claude and Merle William at 23rd Street and Party for three dollars and fifty cents a day. And she would always talk about uh, uh, Mrs. William and Dr. William and Claude and all of this. But to make a long story short, she would sit on the porch during the summertime and tell us stories how things were when she was a girl growing up. How the kitchen house was away from the main house and it was a walk board that went to it. And how the hogs would be under the house because the house was kind of like on the steel. And how they would take lids out of the, uh, the, the cans and cover the knot holes in the floor and so forth and all. But these very vivid stories she would tell gave you such an imagination. Then there was this photo album that she kept. And somebody would pass the street and say, Hi, Miss Bonnie Jean, and she would speak. And then she said, Go ahead and get Grand's album. And we would look at it, and she said, That's helping her on. 
and I can see him as a small boy. That's Charlie and Diane. And you see them as a small child of that particular way. Then there was this article in there, Negro lynched by mob, uh, dragged from jail and lynched. Ministry deep grave. This was in Popperville, Mississippi. I still have the article. There was another article. Jesse L. Brown, African American native flower, the first one, shot down over Korea. And his plane was, was long. They made a movie of it. Uh, his co pilot ditched his plane and tried to remove him from the plane, but the future laws was up against his leg. So he froze to death and they bombed him. I knew his daughter, and uh, she went to school at Southern University. So my grandmother kept these things. At her early age, I began to understand the importance of adopting in one's community, who we are and what we do from day to day. And that has always stuck with me. That has always been, uh, uh, you know, important to me. There was a man named Mr. Mack. Mr. Mack worked for Wilma Gas Company. He wore the broken and shoes that you see the kids like to wear now with the lace on, you know, the big boots like, the come all. And most mornings, especially during the summertime, Mr. Mack would be walking and he had his little, he had his pipe. And we said, hey, Mr. Mack. He said, hey, I'm going to meet the man, going to meet the man. <laughs> and that's where he would be going, going to meet the man. And so every morning, almost about seven o'clock, you could see Mr. Mack going. Wearing his cover hall with a big smile on his face, he will walk to work and so forth. So these are the kinds of things and the people that I knew within the community and so forth. This is the kinds of things that I found in Fourth Ward, but not only in Fourth Ward, but Sunnyside, Third Ward, uh, and Egypt. And this is what has always been important to me to document who we are. And because of those stories that my grandmother told, uh, you had to use your imagination. So for me to document and to bring those imagination to life to be able to pass on to other people, my job is to put it before the viewer. And it's up to you to come to your own conclusion based on your own personal experiences. And this is what we do. But then how do you connect with your subjects? Because oftentimes I'm thinking about, and I don't see it in this gallery, maybe it's in the other Fourth of July, Fourth Ward, Fourth of July. Well, and people and they're outside and they're having like a picnic, but it's as though you're there, you're in the moment. I, I think that that can be said about a lot of your images. So I'm just wondering how do you find that connection? Well, first of all, you have to respect your subject. You have to respect humanity. You have to love what you see that is happening. You become a part of it from a distance. And what you do, you observe. And you treat it very gentle and quiet because it's a sacred moment that you have that I can capture this. You know, why am I privileged to be here at this precise moment? And really what you do, you quietly, you quietly, you quietly in your own way is to make a picture of it. You know, we use the word take a picture, but you make a picture. Now, Mr. Provost always used the word uh, go and make the photograph. He never said go take the picture because why am I going to take it if I'm going to take it? You know, I'm going to take it with me. I'm going to take this whole scene with me. So I make the picture of the scene. And this is what I've done, this is what Ray and I've done together, and we make pictures. I never asked my subject to pose. One little boy up there on the wall called him out. Hey, mister, take my picture. And this is how he posed. But I never actually asked a person to pose. If you're standing in a way in which I don't want, I move. And if we have connected, you follow me. And then you get the best to what is he about to do? You know, click. I might hold a small conversation, but in most cases I nod and keep on moving. Because the aura of that individual, what he is doing at that time is so important that you don't want to really create a problem. You don't want to break the vibe when 
telepathically, you connect with your subject. You see the face, you see the way you use the sunlight, you actually feel. And, you know, that's a personal, as you can say, that's a personal climax of joy that you have and it's sacred at that precise moment. And this is how I operate. But even making a photograph and having these sacred spaces, and I want to talk about like your process, you being in the dark room, because I know that for you, that's always been a very sacred place. Yeah. And what is it that you see when the image starts to appear? And how do you decide how you're going to, not manipulate, but like, you know, I just remember when we were going and uh, selecting photographs for Moments, Memories, and Voices, and I remember, and that was the first show, my first show at the African American Library of the Gregory School, and as a formal curator, and um, I literally like lived in Heaven Hall Studio, <laughs> lived there. I mean, yeah. that couch was my couch. Yeah. Um, his late wife, Brenda, would bring you grapes. She'd come in, she'd check on us, and go down to the dark room. Yeah. And it was this space that we knew, I'm saying we, because Brenda, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. that was sacred to you when you were in there creating those photographs. So I just wanted to ask you about that process for you, for Well, you. the dark room, it is a sacred place because I've slept in the dark room. Uh, a lot of nights I put a, made a pallet on the floor mm -hmm. and when I come in from TSU uh, having done four or five assignments within a day or whatever and you process the film and you print it and you carry it back and this is what we've done over the years and I keep saying we because Ray was part of that process as well uh, digital makes it so easy and People today will ask, and I'm going around and around, about something that you shot 10 years ago. Can you send me a copy of it? And yes, I can, but I got to go back and go to the negative. I got to either make a print, or either I got to scan the negative, and then send a print. And then if you're not proficient with that process, then you have to rely on somebody just like a good friend of mine, Mark, had just walked in, who was a graphic artist, and who handled all of that kind of stuff at GSU when he was there for a while. But for me, the dark room is sacred. I like to organize. Believe it or not, if you would see my studio, you say organize, but the dark room, I have to have everything that I need in place, set it up, put on some music, get some snacks or something to nibble on, look at my negatives, think about the print, but all that day uh, a lead up to the session when I print, I'm actually printing in my mind. Uh, you see in the picture how you basically want it. And then you go in and you make your test print and my mind goes all the way back to high school each and every time. In high school, I had a professor, Professor Lewis, who taught us the difference between the physical change and the chemical change. The physical change was imagine a piece of paper. So the chemical change was the drugstore negative, light box 1001, 1002, into the developer. And when I saw that, it was a whole new world of actually seeing the process of an image developing up. So each time I print, I think of that, and it goes back, and that's my fear, that's my motivation. It caused me to move forward. Uh, all of the images you've ever seen of mine, I have made the print. I can attest that there's only one person in this world who has ever made a picture from my negative, and he's sitting right there, that's Ray Douglas Karen. Uh, something that we needed at work, uh, something of this nature, Hey man, I'll go ahead and print. Okay, you take the negative, and I trust him. We trust each other from that standpoint of view. Uh, so, but this is how it has always been. Then, into the developer, 
and to the stop bath, and to the first phase, and then to the second phase, and then into the wrench uh, from there. Then your pitcher is in a holding tray, and then you either wrench them, and you put them on the screen, you let them dry, and then you come back later, and you introduce them to water again, you go through um, hypoclearing agent, from hypoclearing agent into selenium toner, and to hypoclearing agent for two minutes or whatever until you get tone that you like. Then you take from there into a water and rinse it, and then into the wash. From there, once it's dry, then you have to go back and dust spot it. Then you have to flatten the print, and then the print has been curated and you check it. And you sleep it, or even you sign it. But I don't sign all of my prints at the time. I'll sign my prints when I'm about to go to a show, or I keep them uh, organized in such a way uh, in the order in which I made them, and I'll sign them at a later time. Mm -hmm. But this is the process you know, in the dark room, and this is repeated over and over and over each time you print. And the joy of it is each time you print, you end up with a different image. Now, people say, well, you got the negative, and so you make it a picture. The chemistry is different, the temperature is different, the time is different. You feel different, like when you get up in the morning or during the day, you look at an image and then you love it and you like it, but you got a starting point. And you look at it, the contrast is different, the paper is different than it was 15, 20 years ago. The chemistry is different, the technique. So each time, it's a new image, and it's a new process over and over and over again. It's like a love affair. <laughs> you do it over and over and you experiment it's different, it's every time. It should be. <laughs> it should be. Yep. Yeah. Um, I like to talk about, I just, a moment when you were saying, you get up early. Yeah. And I remember when we were going through our process, you were just like, call me, I'm up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I'm doing this. And I remember a story where you said that Dr. Biggers, and I know you mentioned, mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Freeman, mm -hmm. Dr. Provost, mm -hmm. Mr. Lewis from mm -hmm. high school, but Dr. Biggers, um, I think he came, told you to come to the house to shoot something. I guess it was photographs of him in his studio. Yeah. And you might have been a little late. You know, well, it, you know or, it was for uh, something else. Uh, it was for a, it was some work that I had to do for him, mm -hmm. and he was waiting. And this was early on in our relationship. I was the Dr. Uh, Biggers from the early 70s up until he passed in 2019. Ray and I both from time to time. But I went there one day and I was there. He said, up on. I said, yeah, Doc. He said, if you're going to work for me, he said, you have to be on time. He said, every morning that I get up before I can start my day, he said, I have to take my medication. I have to take my blood to see where I'm at. He said, I have to do this every day. And he said, if you're going to work with me, you have to be on time. I said, yeah, Doc. I said, okay. And from that, I learned, you know. And when I would go in the morning sometime to the studio, after he had left TSU, I would go there, and he'd be out there working in the studio. Then he'll be on the district to take us and he'd be sitting out there. He'd be working on a painting or whatever, or high up. And uh, he said, hey, boy, what's going on? I said, Doc. I got a picture I want you to look at. <laughs> and he looked at it. He said, hey, boy, this is hip hop. I said, hip hop? He said, yeah, he said, but no. You don't know what hip hop is? I said, no, no. I said, no. He said, man, this is hip hop. And that is so he named that picture hip hop. And, uh, you know, another time I came over and I had the picture. And I said, Doc, what do you think of this picture right here? He said, hey, man. He said, that's Mr. Shine. And that's how the picture of Mr. Name, Mr. Shine came about. And he said, man, can you see how somebody that's hit that? He said, black folks. He said, they shine in the sunshine. <laughs> and, 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 and so uh, we talked about it. And then he would go into African proverbs and about African art and the relationship between man and nature and how we have to coexist and so forth and on. And so it takes me again, it takes me back to the stories that my brother would tell and so forth. And so all of this began to come together. And 
I began to realize the richness of the people that I was around. I felt that I was very privileged. So Carol Sim, who taught ceramics, who wanted me to major in ceramics. And I refused to major in ceramics, though, but I threw pots and so forth. But no, well, you should major in ceramics. I said, Mr. Sim, uh, well, boy, uh, just keep on doing your pitches. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and so, uh, no, no, this is what I was doing. And then John would always say, but no, this is sin. In my house, it was a sin to be lazy. He said, it was a sin. And then that reminded me of the time that my father, who worked on the railroad as a switchman, and sometimes would work late, after 11 o'clock, uh, down in what they call the back party, unloading pine rods and uh, stumps uh, at Hercules Power Company. Uh, he rode the train with a lantern, uh, swinging, and then switched the train from track to track. And then in the morning, during the summertime, the spring of the year, we wake up and look out the back window. You hear my father like that. Ha, 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 come on, Carl, get up, get up. He find his view in God, which we didn't necessarily lack when we approached to the school. And our friends could see, oh, we got a mule. <laughs> we got a hog down here in a hog pen. We got chickens and everything. People had large parts of land, simple like we have out there in Sunnyside and uh, Acres Home and so forth and on. Uh, they always said that my father came from the country, but he brought the country with him. But yet still, uh, he was always working. And so when uh, John Bigger talked about it was a sin to be late. So my father was always busy in the morning. The boys get up, get up, get up. The cows is out. The hogs is in the field. Get up, get up, get up. And so that's what we did. In the evening, when we come home from school, we have a job. You hold down the road in the garden and hold back up. And then you were through. And it was four of us. So by the time you hold down one more and come back up, we have almost did a row. We chop here, we chop there, cut the grass out, come on back. Then we were free to do what we wanted to do. So these are the kinds of things that I see in people, in faces, expressions, laughter, uh, 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 you know, pain, people crying. I remember the sound that I heard uh, from our house around the corner, which is about four minutes from the building across the street from Miss Recipe, the evening that she screamed, uh, you, know, uh, you know, her son, lightning struck, and after it struck, boom, and then clanged lightning struck and you can hear that scream and boom and you hear that and uh, I didn't go around the top truck went to, we didn't go my mother told us to stay there but it, you know you know, you hear that so that sticks with you so you see that anguish in people and you have to imagine that so these are the kind of things you know that I make an attempt to document so that it affects you 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 in your own personal way and all I can do is put it before you. Same thing that happened to me in Vietnam. And here he is my good friend, we call her Demodol, <laughs> Dr. Jones, who is a staff supporter of veterans who work for the city. And she has assisted me in, you know, getting past the symptoms of PTSD and Asian Orange and all of those kinds of things that you have to go through. And the flag, I use the flag a lot in my work. And people don't realize how when you have to see the national anthem being played and the flag waving and how people laugh and they talk and they disrespect it as we are just as friends in the stands and it's not sacred to you. But when you is in a situation and you see a helicopter coming in to land to take out the wounded and it's flying a giant American flag, it has a special meaning to you. And then when it takes some of your friends away, when it takes them away for their last ride, that sticks with you. And you never get past it. And so that symbol of the flag is always important to me. But yet still, beyond that, is the sensitivity of how we live and what we do, the struggle of people. Uh, we find it when I went to Tanzania to see a guy on the skateboard. 
and with gloves on. Just don't let him get around. And if he don't move, he don't eat. Uh, you know, I went to, to, to Haiti, to down to South America, to Argentina, to, to these places. If you don't move, you don't eat. My whole thing is to get off of the beaten path. I like to see how people live, uh, you know, what they do from day to day, uh, the struggle. Uh, we look at people, or I look at, and I respect homeless people, how they survive in the element, how they maneuver, and so forth. And we call it, in the inner city streets farm, how people get around how they are able to do. But you go to a foreign country, the kids on the street know the history. They act as the guys. They can carry you everywhere and so forth and all. They can tell you about what's going on. And you see all of that. And then you begin, you begin to understand. They said, well, they can't learn. Well, you know, they're not this, they're not that. And so you learn so much from people and the individuals. That's what they do from day to day. These are the things that's always been important to me. Is there anything that is off limits to you? Like, it's something you won't capture. And I guess I was just thinking about your, your memory of, you know, your neighbor and the sounds and thinking about people's faces. And I know you want to capture a, a lot of moments. Well, uh, I, I, I I'm going to say that it is anything that I won't capture. It's what I'm privileged to see in my day-to-day -day activity as I move about. One good example is a picture called Roots. I was coming up Scott Street one day toward Wheeler, across from where University of Houston is, before they widened Scott, and I was driving, and I see these kids standing by the trees as they are in the photograph. So I had to make a decision. I was in a moving lane of traffic, which was next to the curb. So I just stopped, <laughs> got out, laid down on my back, and shot up and made the photograph. Wow. I didn't interfere with the kids. I didn't say, y'all move over here and pose or whatever. They didn't interfere with me. They kept looking off into the distance. And that was a profound moment. Uh, you know, I couldn't have staged it any better. And definitely, if I had moved my car, I couldn't have laid down to make the picture because cars would have been coming. So I made that particular photograph that way. So these are the kinds of things that you have to take advantage of at those precise moments. And this is what happened. Tell us about the time where you forgot your camera. You saw the boy sleeping. Oh. <laughs> I went to Haiti on a travel study tour with the university. And Mr. Carol Sim, who teaches ceramics, who taught ceramics at TSU, was my roommate. And adjacent to our hotel, which was called the White Hotel, it had a big front porch with a veranda around it and steps that went down. And it had a cobblestone walk that went about the distance from here to across the street and it's about as wide as the door opening here. And so there was a French bakery. They sold bananas, the ladies, and you can buy bread. So I did it out there one morning, going down, and I looked. And at the end, there was a knee wall about this high. And that little boy was sitting there asleep. So I turned around and ran back up the step, around the corner, up the second floor, down the hall, boom, slammed me in the door. Mr. Sim said, hut pop. What on earth is wrong with you? I said, Mr. Sim, shut up, shut up, don't mess with it. So I grabbed two cameras, my 35, and my Hasselblad, and I went back, and I kneeled down, and I made a picture of Sleeping Boy. Shot it from the back, there he is there. I shot it from the front, took the camera, shot it in color from the back, shot it from the front, and just as I got through, some other little boys came along and thumped him on the head. <laughs> and, and he woke up. But he woke up. But have you ever slept wow. and the impression yeah. of the quilt or something is embedded in your face? That's the way it was. He had been sleeping there all night. So that was probably the most profound moment that I had 
as a photographer, they saw as the excitement. And that's the first image that was purchased by the MFA. Now, people ask, when did you start taking pictures? In high school, after that experiment with Professor Lewis, I had my father's camera that he had purchased in Jolly, Illinois. And my father made a lot of pictures while he was in the military. Him and his friend just changed to do a picture, do this, do this. So he got pictures of him standing by the tree with his MP uniform on, laying in the bed, reading just like he's going to sit into his girlfriend or whatever he was doing, and standing by the train and all of this when he worked at Hercules. But, but, in, but, uh, but in other words, uh, I took that camera and was shooting pictures one day and was up at this swimming pool. Well, take a reason, I, I turned loose. Camera fell into the pool. Oh, Lifeguard jumped in, got it, handed it to me. I took it home, hid it in the attic. <laughs> about 10 years later, my dad and I, we talked about it. Uh, he mentioned it to me, but he never said anything about it from there. So, uh, you know, that's the way in which it goes. So it's so many connections about the photograph that I've had over the years in that particular way. Ray made a picture of a cemetery in East Texas with the trees and the river you can see and the water running or you can see it from there. I thought it was one of the most profound pictures that he made. Then another friend of ours named Roy E. William, who loved photography so much, who worked for Southern Pacific. And God was a student at TSU, and he followed Ray and myself. He read a lot. He made a picture of his mom in a country kitchen. I still have the print. But it's so profound. It is just so natural. You can identify with it, and you see so much. And this is what life is about, the sensitivities. Everything just come alive that way. And the pictures is in the little brochure. Ray made it. But a lot of times people don't give you credit for what you do. And this is what we do. This is the only thing we have to leave behind for people to enjoy. So if my images stimulate your memory in some sort of way, no matter who you are, no matter what color you are, uh, you know, if it affects you in some sort of way, then I feel my job is done with the work. I can't do anymore. But to try to technically make it sound <laughs> and present it to you in such a way. But the dark room is sacred. Believe it or not, my wife came to the dark room probably less than a dozen times throughout our and uh, courtship and marriage. She knew that was my space. It wasn't a restriction that she couldn't come. She just respected it from that standpoint of view that she didn't come. She didn't come out to the studio, but into the dark room. Yeah. That's your, that's your first 
this day. You ask if you can take a picture. Uh, the, the main thing to do is to observe quietly, respectful. Not like you're stalking, but uh, you know, or you nod, or you, you know, you speak, or whatever the person is asleep. But then again, you are very privileged to make an image. But then again, some people say that it's almost like you're stealing, you're taking something. No, you are making a statement that way. But when you approach people, I always do it very cautiously. I nod. And you know, we have a language of communicating just through eye contact. Or you see a person and you nod. Uh, and in our community, a lot of times, we be passing the street, we see somebody, we are not like this, the person is do like this, and then, you know, that's acceptable. They recognize you uh, that particular way. And either we are brothers, we have the same blood, or we understand each other, or whatever. But I always keep my camera in front of me. And then when I see someone, if I'm approaching you, my camera is always present. It is out front. And a person can be curious. Uh, either I think they go into a mode to start to code in a way, in their own way, <laughs> what they are doing or what they are not doing. And they anticipate your next move. And so I look and I take my camera, look, look back at them, and I just stay raised and look at you. And then I have my image. Um, sometimes we may talk. Sometimes we may not. The person may know I like that. And you allow them to keep doing whatever they're just doing. But uh, either you stop. And I want to make a picture of this lady here. But I may look over to the left or look over to the right. There may be something over there that I'll photograph pretty quickly. Then that individual feels, uh, I'm not a threat to them. Mm -hmm. This person isn't shooting my picture for a reason because I got an outstanding parking ticket or I got this or whatever is wrong or high up. And then you can turn, you can nod and speak, and you see them, and you look and you say, wow. <laughs> 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 So this is what you do with people. Uh, really, I think individuals invite you into their lives at that precise moment, and you take advantage of it, but respectfully. And then sometimes you have people tell you, no. Mm -hmm. One guy, my homie guy says, one day I shot a picture and said, hey man, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you you know, you find those kinds of things. Sometimes you you know. But whenever I travel, even when I was very privileged to travel with the debate team, or even to go to Africa and very quick, I try to get off the beat pad, even in Rome, even in Argentina, to try to see how everyday people live, their struggles, their desires, their hopes, the things that go on. Uh, this is where you find the essence of life. You find out that we all want the same thing. We all desire the same thing. It comes in a different way, but we desire the same. You know, we want the same for our children, for our community, you think. But it comes in a different way. Even the bad people want the best of things. Everybody wants the best of things. And so, this is what I try to capture. So I don't pass up an accident. I don't pass up this because it brings awareness. I don't pass up a homeless person if it's a picture of dignity in a way of struggle that represents the human spirit because it brings attention to what we should be doing as a community of helping people in such a way. I've seen people step over people on the sidewalks downtown. Why is he stepping over a human being? You can walk around 
or don't step over them just because they're blocking the walk, walk around. You know, we do the, you know, we do things for a small puppy, we we'll find a puppet, but a puppet is not a threat. A person in a way who don't look like us, or don't dress like us, or don't that it is, isn't like us at that precise moment tends to become a threat. And I try not to approach it as a threat. I've been very lucky over the years. I've never been a constant on the street. I've never, the only thing that I was out once, and they said, there he is, he's coming this direction. <laughs> and I said, whoa, and, uh, I was in the community for one student some photographs, but nothing ever happened. I always speak, people say, hey, uh, Say, oh, say so you from you from Yate? I said, no. I said, that's my friend Ray Tarrant. We know we know what you know, do. Do. And then again, I always do like this. Oh, you from TSU? And somebody say, oh, I remember you. You TSU photographer. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people know you from that. You meet a lot of nationalities of people from various places. You befriend a lot of people. And so, this is what life is about. Talk about that a lot. I mean, you were at TSU for for a span of well, 50 years. Well, I started school there in '68. I started working there full time in '78. But from 1970, from the time that Ray first published, and Ray Karen and I keep mentioning Ray because Ray was a yearbook editor. That was my first photograph was published in the yearbook, the 1970 yearbook at TSU. And from there, through the Model Cities program with Dr. Freeman. Dr. Freeman was always into reacting with the administration. He was a part of it through the weekend college and that. So putting on, great. He took up. He had us to go here, over to Rice, where he taught religion and rights for 20 years. We would go over to Rice to make pictures, to community college to make pictures, to his church to make pictures. And that took us into the fifth ward and so forth and on. And then we would go to meetings and so forth. Uh, things of this nature. When Secretary Hood came to of uh, Washington, D.C. to TSU, we made pictures and so forth. And, you know, and dignitaries to come, so that's just mostly to be labyrinth and, right. and gasping and so forth. That was just another person. We were making a photograph. So, but this was a part of our lives. True, we missed a lot as college students of being a college student mm -hmm. because we had to conduct ourselves in such a way that there's a lot of pictures that I wanted. <laughs> you know, for various reasons, you know, but yet and still. But it was a joyful time. Question? I was wondering, do you have any travel, any planned travel? I would love to. I have a 17 year old daughter, she just turned 17. She has her junior year and her senior year of high school, then she'll be off to college. And I have two dogs and a rat. <laughs> and so in order for me to move, those things have to be secured, well taken care of. Uh, so there's plenty to do in the Houston area. Uh, there are a few little small towns that I would love to go and spend two or three or four or five days and document. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at my work as a complete body of work, uh, it's divided because of how I'm able to move about. Now, if you take the fourth ward, you would find a more concise body of work. You take the third ward and mm -hmm. go back. But most people if you gravitate toward my individual portrait than they do the overall community, mm -hmm. such as the architecture. I love the work of Walker Edwards. And then you would see stuff such as uh, Pettis and the, uh, 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 what's that, Beauty Box and things of this nature uh, uh, that was in third ward that was so prevalent that people identified with uh, and so forth and on. So it's just a matter of how we look in the field from the curator or whatever. And sometimes, you know, you go along and you see it a different way when somebody else put it together and say, hey, that's great, you know, to see it this way. And something else to say another way. Thank you. Um, back in 2004, I had the privilege to see you on campus at Texas Southern University, and um, just your walk spoke <laughs> so much to me every time I saw you. And I didn't know you 
but I just knew that, okay, he, he has the camera, like he said, he always has that camera, mm-hmm. and I just, I admired it so much, and then later on in life, I actually got to take a picture of him capturing a moment mm-hmm. um, in his neighborhood, mm-hmm. and when I was driving up the street, I saw him walking, he had told me that there had been a fire in his neighborhood, and I come driving up, and I see him walking fast <laughs> down the street with his camera, and he was going to go capture uh, some things. And I was like, is it okay if I take pictures of you? You know. And so I just, in the distance, I was taking pictures of him. And it, it meant a lot to me, because sometimes, you know, like, um, they don't, they capture everyone else, but no one's capturing them. So I, I, it was important to me that day because it was exciting for me to first of all see him walking so fast with that camera uh, and, and and actually connecting with his his, his actual neighbor. Um, this is your lifetime achievement award session here. So is there something that you have yet to to capture um, that you really have been wanting to? If there's something that you could capture, what would it be? Well. I can't say. In other words, I would love to, which I'm planning on doing, it's just been some days. And when I mean days, I mean a full day, a full week. Every day, you get up and go into the community and photograph and just walk and to capture it as you see it for a solid week. When we make a trip and you go to a place, like when I was in Haiti, uh, in Belize, or uh, Argentina, you have a certain period of time to work. But here, because of other things, because of having a full-time job, uh, you uh, you know you skip and you hop. It's like if you take a rock and you throw it on the water and you skip. It. Well, your photography becomes similar that way, but you're still pursuing the same thing. But yet still, what if you had the time to follow it from beginning to end? And this is what I truly want to be able to do since I have left TSU. Uh, My time is more free. I have more control over my time because I'll be going to an assignment, and he said, oh, no, you need to be there at 10.30. And I said, okay. And I'll be going, and I'll see a picture along the way. I'll stop and make the picture. I get there 10 minutes later, but I get there just in time to do what I have to do. But it's always has been this kind of a thing. And in the evenings, uh, I'll stop, and I'll make pictures. When I get home, uh, my wife had cooked dinner, and the food is on the stove and uh, you know, things of this nature. So, but on the weekends, I would go into the fourth ward on a Sunday and photograph, and on a Saturday and photograph, and things of this nature. When I worked for Mr. McElroy at the informal newspaper, uh, he would send me on assignments to different parts of the city. And then you see other things that you need to capture. And so, uh, you know, changing your routine, your mode of travel, or moving into different aspects. I always, when I come through Third Ward, I go a different way down the street sometimes. Sometimes I'll get in and just ride and just look and then come back and say, I need to come back and photograph this. I need to come back and photograph that. I want to be able to do more of that consistently um, over and over again. And I think that, you know, you know, this is what I want to do. And so I can find the joy and the experiences and the gratification in my community, and I'm talking about Houston, as well as I can anywhere that I go. So, you know, you just have to be able to use the critical eye of sin. And that's what we, a lot of us fail to do. We don't use the critical eye of actual sin. So I 
dance, at least I'll attempt to answer anything. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to interject a little something if you, if you would let me do it. Uh, I backdoored into photography. It was not really on my plans to be a photographer. But at the same time that I backdoored, pretty much like Earl did, you incorporated some of the things that meant something to you into your photographs. I look at this photograph here of all these people in, in <coughs> church. I see these boys and whatever have you. I am trying, and Earl has done the same thing, of documenting what is familiar to us for people who look like us. I was the only black person on the tennis team. I was sudden, something like an enigma to, to the people that saw me come out there and play, and oh, he's playing tennis and whatever have you. But at the same time, I was aware of people like Arthur Ashe and how I wanted to be like Arthur Ashe. I wanted to be like Arthur Ashe because I saw and could identify with Arthur Ashe and that's what I wanted to be like. When I think about all of the black photographers, Hispanic photographers, I think of common commonality right here. You know, uh, you, you forgot to, to mention Mr. Rodney Evans. Yeah. who is very, very important to us because of what he did. All of the people that he touched that became photographers. You know, it's very, very important that we have our kids identify with someone who looks like them. Who looks like them. Who are capturing emotions, the emotion of a mother with a, with a baby right there. Emotion of kids playing right there. Playing right there. How many... And how many other people do you know that are doing that? I mean, I'm not saying that nobody else is doing it, but it becomes a common, and I can feel, I feel this, I feel this. I don't just look at it, oh, it's a pretty picture, oh, it's a pretty picture. I feel it, because I've been in situations like this. I've been, I, I know that where that place is over there. I know where that place, I know where a lot of these places are. What means a lot to me, that I haven't really gotten into as much as I want to, is the number of churches in Third War. Only because I do churches and I'm a deacon in my church and whatever have you, and I got in, I want to see more so that they have more of a positive something to deal with. What I would love to see, and I know Earl would be the same way, what I would love to see, I mentioned this earlier, is us introducing photography for younger ages instead of waiting to high school Give them a little snapshot thing where they can do it and gather pictures and write the history. My mama, da, da, da. my mama was born, da, da, da. put it in a scrapbook. First year, second year. So that by the time they got to be in, in college or grown, they got their history. They got their history. They got something they can identify. Even if their history is not all that great. It's there. It's there. It's their history. Something that they, they got to deal with. And that's what Earl and I really, and, and, and a lot of things, you can see, I can see it in everything that he does. Well, it's interesting because somebody asked me, actually two things, when I found out that, when they asked me to interview you, mm -hmm. and someone asked me to describe your work, and I was like, I think that Pudnall creates a black commodity that cannot be bought. It is something about the way in which you capture moments that, like you said, Mr. Carrington, like we, we can identify with. If you've been to a black church, you know that woman in the back. <laughs> you know, if you've been to a garden, you've seen Hudnall's mom. You know, um, a funeral. I can see myself there in front of my father's castle. You know, and I think those are the things that, again, it's such a commodity Mississippi, 
the picture over there where you see Blackwater Baptist Church, where those pine trees are around. I went there as a small boy with my father and my grandmother, and her sister came up after church uh, on the wagon with a mule, mm -hmm. and on the back of the church, in the bed of the wagon, she had the Muslim sheets there. And boy, I mean, she had all kind of food. She had a piece of Muslim, Muslim oat. And we sat on the church lawn and ate dinner that day. And that evening we went back in, and the elders sit down, and they started prayer service. And he even pat the feet. And, you know, that way before they start eating the service. And that lady sitting there in poor boy eating reminded me and carried me back. It's just little things like that. The way in which a person may smile, uh, you know, it carries you back. The way the sunlight, you look at a person, you look at the beautiful of their teeth, their eyes, their hair, uh, the way in which they walk or they move, it reminds you of something. You see a person hurrying and running and ducking and trying to get around something, it reminds you of something. And so, you know, that's the way it was all the way throughout my life, even through, uh, and I refer back to Vietnam, even though it was tragic and a war, but it was a, more or less, a kind of a struggle with oneself in doing, of believing in yourself, that you can survive, that you will survive, that you can accomplish something, and, you know, take care of your mission, and then come home. So I never had any doubt, or I was concerned, sure, was I scared? Yes, at times. But, you know, this is how it is. I figured I can do most things. If I see you do it, and I got to do it if it's manual, or something of that nature, I can't see you, I can do it. At least I will try, because my father always said, you can only do things. Anything is worth the try. You can only do two things. You can fix it or you can tear it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's just as common as you can put it. You can fix it or tear it up. So it's worth the try. When you look at when you look at the people that are photographed, potentially that man, that boy right there could be a world economist or something like that. If, if, loaded, if he's exposed to the, that kind of thinking, that he can go from that football in his, on his hip to head of, you know, right now. But, this is, this is a big but. <laughs> but, our growing up, Earl is, is almost two years older than me. 18 months. 18 months. <laughs> older than me. We grew up in segregated society. Elementary school, my elementary school was all black. I made the break when I was forced, well not forced, but when my family had to move from Austin, Texas, where I was born, to Corpus Christi, Texas, where they had already integrated. And I went from being in a segregated situation, all black school, to an integrated school, black, brown, and white. Damn. You know, everybody was supposedly equal. They were equal. They were treated equally. You felt that you could do anything. So when I went to volunteer to go play on tennis team, it's because I thought I had the talent to play there. And for years, for the first two years, I was the only black person on tennis team. Then here comes some girls. Then here comes another boy. They want to play. And then I fooled around there and got a scholarship to the University of Houston. I'm on my way. What happened? What happened? My senior year, the coach at the University of Houston died. And they suspended activity until they could find a replacement. I had to find some place to go if I didn't want to go to Vietnam. That was it. Earl went to Vietnam. I missed Vietnam because I didn't want to, I didn't want to go fight nobody I didn't know. They didn't, didn't do nothing to me, as so I was thinking. But here comes a man by the name of Herbert Joseph Pro Provost, the photographer that we're talking about. Came all the way from Houston, Corpus Christi, Texas, because he had heard about me and wanted me to come to TSU. I didn't want to go to no TSU. 
My sister went to TSU. I knew about TSU. I wanted to go to the University of Houston where I had been talked to. Talked with the, the coach at the, at the University of Houston had invited me to stay at his house in anticipation that I was going to be on the tennis team. That's how I got so. But then I said, I better get somewhere here so I'm going to get drafted. And that was the, one of the best things that happened to me because I ran into people who encouraged people to become. So now I combine history that I love. I love history. I love knowing about my history. I combine history with photography. I want to take pictures of important people, important things, important places. I look at Dowling Street and I see places up there that are no longer there, that, that, that grocery store that was up there for a long time. Uh, the, the club that was that was there owned by come on what are we what are we doing that we're that that becomes a discouragement that becomes discouragement to to do something on your own grocery store on your own barber shop when I talk about barber shop my my mama was a full time nurse R N come home lay down went to sleep opened a beauty shop that was attached to the house all my life. Same thing as Earl. Two girls, four boys. She would tell you, you're going to college. Period. Don't care none of what else you say, you're going to college. I'm done. I'm, I'm preaching. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> and and I must I must do this. Baby, stand up. Baby, stand up. Wait, man. Wait, man. No, 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 no. No, no, no stop. It. Okay. <laughs> I'll do that. Okay. 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 Well, maybe you want to do it. Maybe you want to do it. Uh, because of him. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. There was a lady in the back that was an art major at TSU that I tried to talk to very early on. Her name is Regina Hart. And Mr. Sim, ceramic teacher, knew her mother. G, and he encouraged her to come to TSU. And believe it or not, uh, she switched her major to uh, physical education. And for some particular reason, she ran in to a guy named Ray Douglas Karen uh, through a friend of ours who played baseball. But she is one of the first persons that I made portraits of at TSU in the art department. And she is, as they would say, my Miss TSU. She was Miss Texas University mm -hmm. in 1973. That's Regina Beatrice. 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 Karen. <laughs> That's Ray's wife. Uh, you know. And uh, uh, I'm going to say this, and I'm through with that. <laughs> Ray was about to be draft had been called and he looked in the newspaper one day and there was a little clip in there whereas uh, the U.S. government did not want 126,000 of them uh, those people who had refused to go Ray cut that little clipping out and he kept it, he probably may still have it but he had packed up he was about to go and he found that clipping, and he changed his mind. His mama even came up from Crawford to say, they called him Ray, Ray, she called him Ray D, Ray Douglas. Ray Douglas, uh, you better go on down there uh, to that draft board and do it. And he said, mama, you better get in that car and go back to college. <laughs> the next day, Ray shipped all of his stuff to his brother up in Austin. And I went over to the dormitory, the Bolton Hall, and one evening, and Regina was there on the rail. Ooh, uh, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. She, she thought he was gone. I said, he ain't gone. He left my house in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's when Ray and I became roommates at that particular time. Uh, from then. So we've been together that length of time. We have used our apartment, our bathroom as a dark room. <laughs> we dry pictures on the floor on the carpet. But we was always about together photography. Photography kept us together. You no know, matter. We was different. Ray was athletic. I didn't play athletics. No, no, I was an artist. Ray was a historian. 
but photography was our bond that we worked and believed in some of the same things. Uh, as you as viewers, you come to see work because it moves you a certain kind of way and you follow an artist because of uh, what you see he or she is doing that you believe in. And this is why people collect because they find something about it that moves them a certain kind of way, just like music, just like people. Thank you, Early Hudnall Jr. for sharing these great stories with us. Congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you. It's overdue. And I think we all look forward to what's to come. Um, and I just want to thank Alfred Todd Jr. for <laughs> yes, Todd. getting yep. suspended from Texas Southern University. <laughs> yep. Giving us the treasure that we have now. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.